Thank you very much and uh, thank you uh, for this great meeting and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, this follow-up talk <laughs> topic uh, uh, from Matan's talk. So I, I will not have to give all the, the basics for it. Um, so it, it, my talk is about uh, a second application. You, you saw Fourier for uh, in the talk also uh, that Matan gave, but uh, now I will show you how that uh, in the same framework, we can build um, a particle code based on memantic finite differences on staggered grids. All right. Um, so, yes. Um, I'll briefly go. Uh, so, on my first slide, I have the structure of loss of Maxwell and the loss of Maxwell equations. I will be very quick here because I already had this uh, um, introduction, or you already had this introduction by Matan. And uh, yeah, then then I will uh, go into the details of this uh, diagram based on memantic finite differences, and yeah, basically uh, explain how the um, the operators are defined based on on the one D sequence, uh, and then extend it to to three D uh, for a tensor product. Uh, then I'll talk about the coupling to the particles. Uh, and finally, show you some numerical illustrations. Uh, and these are numerical uh, results, I should mention, that we have obtained with the uh, with a new implementation based on the ARM RX uh, framework. And uh, so, so somehow the, the motivation of uh, using finite differences is uh, to, to leverage the uh, facilities that, that there are in RMX for uh, exascale computing. And yeah, I mean, you have all the, the, the particle structures and, and the parallelization framework uh, inside there. Uh, and, and we can leverage from, from that to obtain a, a scaling code uh, that can be used to obtain also results for big simulations eventually. Uh, right, um, so just to, to <laughs> remind you all, we, we have the Floss of Maxwell system. So we have this uh, affection equation here um, and uh, it's nonlinearly coupled to, to Maxwell's equation uh, through the charge and current densities. And uh, yeah, following uh, with, with this uh, hyperbolic conservation law, we have the characteristic equation here. Uh, and that's what we use, of course, for, for the particle methods where we have uh, particles that are evolving according to these uh, characteristic equations. <laughs> Um, okay, so important for us is, is the structure in the system, the structure that, that we want to preserve. So there is energy, momentum, and charge conservation, uh, which we have seen several times already today. Uh, and uh, yeah, then we, we can have these equations of motion uh, from uh, either an action principle or a Hamiltonian principle, and all the details uh, were given uh, by, by Martin in his uh, um, talk. And uh, yeah, so uh, a lot is about the discretization of the Maxwell's equation. So I spend, spend a lot of time there. And yeah, there is a lot of structure in there uh, where we have Ampere's and Faraday's law. Um, so, so the dynamic equations here, which have a unique solution um, given a correct uh, initial and um, boundary conditions and, and these divergence constraints remain satisfied over time. All right, and uh, this is coupled to, to this Diram uh, sequence uh, that uh, Martin also showed you. And uh, somehow, yeah, we, we have the, the spaces or the, the, the fields here, we have them all ordered in this sequence, but it's not enough to have one sequence, but we also have this, this dual sequence um, where we, we have, yeah, we can we can order them in, in pairs. So we have the uh, source, um, the, the equations with the source term, uh, where we go in, in one direction, and uh, the source free equations where we go in the other direction. So, um, yeah, if we put in, in this case uh, the 
the electric field uh, in H curl, we can uh, um, obtain the curl here uh, in this direction. And, and here in for the uh, Amperesing equation, instead, uh, we, we have to go then the other way around. And uh, then, yeah, we, we have some kind of dual cur curl, uh, which uh, we denote by curl W, because, yeah, from this finite element framework uh, within which uh, Martin was talking, uh, mostly you, you, you have a dual uh, here, um, yeah, the, the dual equations are in weak form. Yeah, so, so uh, essentially what you do here is to, to have a test function in H curl, and then you put over this uh, curl to the test function. But of course, this is not uh, the way to go when we're talking about um, finite differences. And, uh, but then we also have this kind of dual structure. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll explain uh, now how this can be obtained. <clears throat> so um, in a nutshell, it's illustrated here, but you can do, you, you have uh, parts of the equations on, on the primo grid, uh, which is the, uh, or maybe the one with the um, full line. And then we have uh, another crit, the dual crit, in, which is here, the, the dashed one. And then somehow we have, uh, yeah, we, we say that um, the, uh, the these two equations here, the, the source with the source terms, uh, so that we, they are posed like on we'll, our dual rate, crit. So, so, so with the uh, tilde, we, I'll denote the quantities on the dual crit. And uh, uh, yeah, the other two equations here, they are um, solved, solved on the pre Uh Well, of course, um, this is, um, okay. I mean, then, then you have to find some kind of the relation because yeah, if you, you cannot have a, a, that, or you have, if you have a, a representation on on the dual and the primo grid, um, you, you somehow have to yes. decide how you can get back and forth uh, and between the grids. Um, well, we so this is uh, the idea in a nutshell. Um, uh, yes. Now let's do this a bit okay. more thoroughly. Yes. Uh, um, and here we, we consider a diagram complex. Um, so first, let's look at the, the upper part here, which is the complex. So, so you, what you recognize is here the continuous sequence. So that's the same as before. And then uh, what Matin had was a projection uh, of from this continuous space to a uh, yeah, discrete space, which is still a, a continuous space, uh, but with a, a discrete number of, of degrees of freedom. Uh, but we can also formulate this on, on another level namely on the level of the vector of the decrease of freedom. So if I have a, a finite dimensional space, I can represent it uh, by its discrete, uh, decrease of freedom. And when we're talking about finite differences, it's inherently uh, discrete. So in, in, in this case, we rather talk about, um, yeah, in, in terms of this, this the decrease of freedom. Uh, and then between the decrease of freedom, we have uh, a matrix that is representing uh, the gradient, the curl, and, and the divergence. And then we have some kind of uh, reduction operators uh, that bring us from uh, these uh, continuous spaces functions uh, to the degrees of freedom. So we, like in general, when you talk about finite differences, you have a crit and you represent uh, the functions by their values on the crit. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll do it a little more more involved here in order to obtain this uh, structure preserving uh, finite differences. Um, so this is just the uh, the upper half of our uh, diagram. Um, we have a, a lower half here, uh, which is our dual crit. Yeah, so we have um, uh, here this uh, primal decrease of freedom, and then we have also the dual decrease of freedom, which we denote. Uh, by the tilde. And uh, then, uh, yeah, we have this uh, sequence, uh, this second sequence here, yeah, so this one um, uh, down here, which gives, uh, would be the, the weak uh, sequence uh, when we talk about finite elements. Um, and then we have also, accordingly, uh, the, the matrices uh, representing uh, the gradient, the curl, and the divergence on uh, these <coughs> um, dual crits. 
Um, all right. So um, then uh, let's look at how we would define all these operators in, in this uh, diagram. And let's just uh, for a moment look at 1D because what we do then to, to do it for 3D, um, we're looking at uh, a Cartesian grid so we can just use tensor products of these building blocks uh, to, to, to gain um, the, the three-dimensional versions. So the essential building blocks can be looked at uh, in the 1D case. And uh, yeah, so in 1D, we, we just have uh, the derivative bringing us from H1 to uh, L2 space. So we have just a V0 and a V1 space. Uh, we have our reduction operators and uh, we also have our um, uh, dual diagram. Uh, well, uh, what I forgot to talk about, I also have here this connection uh, between uh, the two parts of the diagram. I didn't talk about this in the last slide, I missed that. Uh, so, so this is a uh, discrete Hodge operator. So, so this is somehow the operator telling us uh, how to go from the quantities on, on the one grid to the quantities on the, on the other grid. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we have to define them. And uh, yeah, in order to define them, I also added something that I didn't have in the diagram before. So we have also this interpolation operator. So we, we can have some kind of operator uh, that re-embeds uh, our, uh, our um, yeah, the, the, the discrete representation into the continuous space. So of course, for finite elements, the natural way is uh, here to to use the basis functions that, that that you have in the finite element basis, but here we have to also define something uh, to to go back to this continuous um, uh, way, uh, and because then we can define our embedding here, our um, our discrete Hodge operator by yeah here we want to go from uh, uh, C1 tilde to uh, C0, and uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the important property of, of these uh, uh, Rams, uh, diagrams is that they're compute, commuting, so you can just go uh, in different directions, uh, and uh, yeah, you, you, you will obtain the same. So if you do here a, a reduction, then you take the derivative, and uh, then you go here with a um, the interpolation operator, you should obtain the same function as if you have had gone uh, this way and just taking uh, the derivative. So then uh, to define this operator, um, what we could do is go here um, with the um, I1 tilde uh, to the continuous space. Then here with, yeah, this is the the, the continuous Hodge, the Hodge of the continuous level, um, and then uh, we go uh, here back to C0 by the reduction operator R0. And uh, yeah, this, this continuous uh, Hodge, uh, this part of the diagram that is not put in here, um, if we're not having metric terms because we, we are on a equidistant grid, uh, this is just an identity operator. All right, so, um, uh, yeah, let's start with the reduction operators. And so this is somehow our, our projection here. And uh, there we can use uh, some projections uh, based on the geometric degrees of freedom, um, which you can also do in, in the finite element context. Um, for Fourier, uh, what Martin was presenting, uh, he was using the uh, L2 projection, but if you, you're not talking Fourier's, you cannot simply use the L2 projection, then you generally use uh, these um, uh, pr projection operators based on, on the geometric degrees of freedom. And what is that? So on, uh, on, on, on the V0 space, um, this is uh, centered on, on points, uh, then, then you just uh, use the function evaluation at the point. So this is what you do uh, when you do standard finite differences, you, you just use your function and evaluate it um, at the point uh, on, on, of your grid. Uh, and then uh, when we are talking about the dual grid, uh, this is just, uh, yeah, you, you have a, a 
a delta x half, so you have the middle point uh, between uh, the two neighboring grid points where you evaluate your function. And then uh, when when it comes to the L uh, the R1, so the v, V1 space, uh, then what you use is an integral over a cell. So it's uh, a cell. Uh, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So in one D, it's, it's based on on your line there, on your interval centered. Um, and yeah, so you use uh, this um, this function here, uh, this integral here from over one cell x, from xi to xi plus one, while uh, for, for the uh, dual grid, uh, you, you just center uh, it differently by uh, centering it around uh, the x1. So you always center uh, your reduction operators uh, here um, the integrals uh, uh, by the grid point on the other mesh. So here, this is centered around x i plus one half, but this is centered uh, by x i. And then the derivative. Taking the derivative is is very simple because uh, so so this is what what we need for for uh, our in in our diagram. So that, that we go through it in a, in a um, commuting way. So if we use uh, the, uh, the gradient, we did, or which is in this case, sorry, I should have written the derivative d d x of, of of phi, where phi is a function in uh, in v zero, uh, then uh, this is um, actually can be represented because it's like uh, the the decrease of freedom that we use. Um, they are, um, I mean, uh, or the, the R here is 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 the uh, integral over the gradient or the, the derivative now. So if we evaluate the this, we we will get the value at x i uh, plus one uh, minus the value at x i. So uh, the derivative is can be expressed in terms of the point values. Uh, times uh, this uh, simple here incidence matrix with uh, minus ones on the diagonal and uh, ones on, on uh, uh, one, the, the first uh, uh, sub diagonal or sub diagonal. And uh, here in this talk, I'm only talking about uh, uh, periodic binary conditions. So, so I have uh, the circulant matrix, but of course, this can be extended to other cases. <clears throat> and uh, uh, when you do the same on on the on the dual grid, uh, you you just get uh, the transpose of of this operator. All right. Uh, now we also need the interpolation operator, and uh, well, we we want to have these commuting diagram properties. So um, yeah, first of all, what we want is that if we evaluate. Um, uh, the, the pro uh, so if we do uh, apply the interpolation operator on our decrease of freedom, uh, yeah, then this should exactly um, give this degree of freedom. Uh, like if I evaluate it at the po point x i, I want to have this at this value that my function has at x i. Yeah, so that we have really. Uh, this point exactly interpolated. In the same way, uh, we also want to uh, recover uh, the, 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 the integrals uh, in, in case of the, the V1 space, so that we have the decrease of freedom uh, properly um, uh, defined. Um, and then uh, what we also need is that if we take the derivative um, of of this L, L1 function, uh, it should be the same as taking uh, the L1, uh, the I1, um, no, the zero function. Uh, it's the same as taking the interpolation operator one uh, and uh, yeah, taking this discrete gradient apply or, or derivative applied to to the the V zero decrease of freedom. And uh, yeah, so if we look at, uh, at these uh, properties here, uh, it, it makes sense uh, here for the I zero to make, to use a definition that is nodal. So we can use, for instance, Lagrange polynomials. And yeah, I, I should say we, we do uh, 
uh, an interpolation or we define this interpolation operator uh, interval by interval. So on the interval xi, xi plus one, uh, we would use Lagrange polynomials. Uh, if we use the lowest order, we would just uh, define it by um, two Lagrange polynomials, one centered at xy and xi and one at xi plus one. But of course, if we want to achieve a higher order interpolator, we can also add more points. Uh, so, so maybe i minus one, xi, xi plus one, and xi uh, plus two. And uh, yes, and, and then uh, we construct, we, we reconstruct our uh, discrete uh, uh, function in this interval uh, by the sum over our uh, the cross polynomials times um, uh, the nodal values. And then, of course, due to this uh, nodal property of the Lagrange polynomials, uh, we will have uh, this, this property satisfied. Um, for the, uh, the, the, the I1, uh, what we would like to have is something uh, yeah, where we have so, uh, a delta um, uh, relation now on, on this uh, integrals, uh, cell integrals, yeah. And uh, yeah, then we would represent our function again by uh, the sum over uh, these uh, polynomials uh, times uh, our um, decrease of freedom, which are these integrals. And uh, due to, to this uh, um, um, orthogonality property in terms of, 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 of these uh, cell integrals, uh, we would also again have uh, this uh, relation satisfied. Um, well, and it turns out that there is a nice relation, uh, so you can uh, write uh, these this polynomials m in terms of the derivatives of the, the, the uh, Lagrange polynomials, and uh, yeah, you 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 can so so you can verify that these parent polynomials indeed have this property. Uh, and then what you can also do is uh, when you use this representation and the representation of the Lagrange polynomials, you can uh, verify uh, this uh, property. I, I don't do it here for you, but uh, you can do it. But just um, I think more um, instructive is to look at an example. Uh, so if we use linear interpolation, so, so in my notation, this would be p equals to zero. So we have here uh, p uh, um, zero and uh, alpha zero and alpha one. Um, so we have a uh, Lagrange uh, polynomial centered uh, at x1 and uh, one centered at x1 uh, one plus one, which is uh, x, uh, no, x i plus one, which is x i plus h, where h is now our grid size. Uh, and then the projected function would, of course, be uh, the sum of uh, these two uh, Lagrange polynomials and uh, the nodal values of the function. And uh, the polynomial um, for, for i1, uh, this, this interpolation operator, will be the derivative um, of, of the second one, which is 1 over h. Um, but due to the fact that uh, the derivatives of Lagrange polynomials sum up to zero uh, because of the partition of unity property of the Lagrange polynomials, um, we also have that this is the same as negative derivative of, of the um, of this zero, the first one of the polynomials. So then when we look at the derivative, um, it's the sum of the derivatives of these two functions, um, but they are uh, 1 over h and minus 1 over h, so we uh, exactly get uh, this, uh, yeah, this form here of, of the discrete uh, create or derivative operator uh, in this case. All right, so uh, this works uh, out nicely and you can go also to higher order and uh, it, it will work out. So from that, uh, as I said before, we can uh, define this, uh, we can destruct our uh, discrete Hodge operators. And uh, yeah, so, so what they do essentially, if you, you look at the, at the 
at the diagram. So you have a, a, a point value on the primal grid, uh, and you want to have uh, the um, uh, the integral on the dual grid, or vice versa. But I mean, if you, I mean, there there's translation invariant, so it's the same uh, whether one or the other is on on the primal or dual grid. And uh, also, we have the invariance between the different uh, uh, cells. So as long as we, we don't have, uh, as long as we have a, an equidistant mesh, uh, we, we will have uh, the same lines. And we can just use, um, yeah, these, these ANSATS functions. So, so we can use this definition and then evaluate uh, uh, the reduction operator. Yeah, and uh, of course, so, so um, if we want to look um, at this uh, first part where we have, um, we want to ha go from the point values on, on the primal crit uh, to the cell integrals on the dual. Um, we now have to say that, okay, uh, because on the, on the primal crit, we defined our uh, intervals for, for where, where we have one definition of our, um, uh, our interpolated function. Uh, the, they go between the grid points on on the primal grid, but now we want to uh, integrate over an interval on the dual grid. Uh, that's why uh, we have uh, two different definitions, two parts of the definition. So in the end, we have uh, three different um, uh, well, yeah, uh, function values evaluated. So <clears throat> with this answer, we would get here a tri triagonal Hodge operator. Um, for the cell integrals, um, on, on, on where we only have one function, we would then have, uh, yeah, when we just want to evaluate at a point, uh, which is uh, xi plus one half on, on dual grid, uh, we'll just use uh, the value um, on, on that we had for, for the integral and, and divide it by one over h. So, of course, uh, this is somehow a second order approximation if we take the midpoint uh, as an approximation for the integral or vice versa. All right, um, so uh, that way we can construct things in uh, 1D and now we can uh, go further to, to 3D. And uh, in 3D, we have a bit uh, more functions. So uh, on the V0 space, uh, we do the same thing. We, we do a point evaluation. Uh, and then our uh, three associates uh, the vector value function to the cir cir circulation of um, uh, circulation on all the edges. So um, now, because uh, yeah, if you look at the the first component of the um, uh, of the uh, reduction operator, that's the component where we had a derivative with respect uh, to uh, x. So in this case, uh, we make, uh, yeah, we, we do an integration over x for the next, uh, over y and the third component over c. Uh, then for uh, the reduction operator for v2, uh, there we'll have an integral over y and c and a point evaluation along x. And uh, finally, in, in the last space, we just have uh, uh, the, the complete cell integral. And analogously, we, we do on the dual grid, uh, we define it by, uh, yeah, in the same way, but uh, centering uh, the, the integrals on the, uh, around the point on, on the primal grid. Okay, I, um, yeah, I, I think I spend a lot of time uh, now in explaining that, so I will not go here uh, through the details on the, 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 the 3D part, so here again we can uh, verify all, all these properties and uh, well in the end what we do now if we get back to our Maxwell's equations uh, where we had uh, two defined on on one crit and the other two on the on the other crit uh, we just uh, work with one representation uh, namely what we will uh, use is um, uh, to to uh, just use uh, e, uh, the electric field on on the dual grid and uh, the magnetic field on the primal grid 
and then uh, we use uh, this discrete Hodge operator uh, to 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 also get uh, the E on on the primo and the B on the dual grid where we need it in our equations. Uh, and yeah, you can nicely see that uh, the equations go through. I don't think I have time uh, to, to go through the details, uh, but instead I want to talk a little bit about uh, the coupling, how we can do the coupling to the particles. And uh, also here um, I can uh, rely on things that, that Martin has introduced to you uh, just uh, about an hour ago. Uh, so uh, also uh, we, we, we use... Um, uh, Klimantovich distribution, uh, this um, um, representation of the distribution function, uh, where we use a particle weight, uh, and we have our particle position and velocity, which are the dynamic variables, and uh, we have some smoothing functions for the uh, for the particles uh, for X space, and that we need this smoothing function uh, because we, we we are using uh, these discrete finite differences. So so here we really uh, have to, to do some smoothing. Uh, and then, uh, based on that, we can define our charge uh, and current densities. And uh, well, then then we discretize our Hamiltonian. And uh, what we use here is use the mean value theorem and and just use a, a representation on the on the dual grid um, and a representation on on the prima grid um, and and uh, combine them. But since we only have one of the degrees of freedom, we we just use uh, the the Hodge operator in here. <clears throat> And then uh, we we look at the Lagrangian, uh, and uh, yeah, here I I just copied from uh, the notation that that uh, Martin had on his slides, and uh, yeah, it, this is the, the semi-discrete version as uh, Martin has, has introduced it. And now yeah, we have this A S and and uh, phi S. So um, we we again have. Uh, and yeah, and, and and what we have in here is these projections, and, and these projections th that are essentially our uh, reduction operators. So here, uh, in this part, I put uh, the reduction operator R two, and I do the one on the dual grid because I represent A on the prima grid. So as uh, here. Uh, we, we use for the integral approximation always a combination on, on the two grids okay. um, because then we always have in, in, in each component one um, nodal and, and one uh, integral representation. Uh, and then once we have uh, this semi-discrete Lagrangian, what we can do is simply apply uh, the uh, Euler Lagrange equation uh, and, and or, or derive the euler lagrange equations for the different dynamic variables. And that gives us a semi-discrete Poisson system. Um, well, I think I don't have time to go into uh, go through all the components, but they look really, really similar to, to what you have seen in, in Matin's talk. Uh, all right, so um, yeah, so just to, to give you a bit of an overview. Where are we? So uh, well, we have this GEMPIC framework where we have done a lot on finite element side, but we can also do uh, this memantic finite differences. And uh, yeah, the, the, the property is, uh, the characteristic properties is to use this Lagrangian, discretize the Lagrangian in a proper way and then derive the Euler Lagrange equations. And uh, for the temporal discretizations, we have two options. Um, that are somehow, or, or we, we considered two options that are uh, uh, conservative. So either having a Hamiltonian splitting or a Poisson, uh, uh, or, or a semi uh, implicit method that is based on discrete gradients. Um, here we, we use uh, the Hamiltonian splitting as you have seen it in, in, in Martin's uh, talk. So essentially we have the same structure so we can use the same type of splittings. And uh, yeah, so for this uh, mimetic finite difference versions, as I said, we have implemented this based on the RMRX uh, framework. And uh, yeah, just to, to show you uh, that this is really um, giving us a good performance, uh, this is uh, some 
kind of a, a little weak scaling experiments uh, that I have done on the COPRA, which is uh, the, the Max Planck uh, Society's um, current uh, HPC system. And uh, I went all the way from one core to uh, uh, 24,000 uh, cores, which is about as close, I mean, it's almost uh, the full um, partition that you, you can can use uh, the, the maximum number of cores that you can use or as close as I could get in, in a uh, suitable scaling here. And you see uh, the efficiency is, is quite good. Uh, well, uh, then uh, just to, to wrap up with some uh, numerical uh, results. So what you see here is um, a comparison of the order of the shape function. So I vary uh, in my approximation here. Um, what kind of, um, uh, how smooth this phase shape function is. And what you should take home uh, from, from this figure is that if you have uh, this side here, where you see that the, the, the low decree is, is good, that which is the side where we have a, a very good particle resolution. Uh, but if the particle resolution is not that good, uh, then it's better to have a, a higher smoothing uh, decree. In that sense. Um, here you can see that, uh, yeah, uh, at low resolution, at least it can make a difference which order of the solver you use. So you can get better accuracy by using uh, this higher order uh, polynomials in your Hodge operator. And yeah, finally, uh, just to, to make sure we have convergence uh, in the conservation properties. So uh, Gauss law is satisfied for all the solver orders. And we have, uh, since it's a Poisson integrator, we don't have exact energy conservation, uh, but uh, we have uh, convergence in the energy uh, conservation with respect to, to the time step, because it's only to the time step that we have errors in, um, uh, in energy. Yes, and um, uh, that's it uh, for me. And uh, yeah, there is, of course, uh, more to explore to leverage uh, more features from the RMRX uh, library. And uh, yeah, then also uh, we're interested in looking at uh, uh, reduced model uh, and in order to be able to, to, to go to interesting physics problems. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So it's time for a few questions. People are tired, it seems so. Uh, I have a question, um, well, which relates to your, there is a figure five that you showed where you show the uh, primary grid and the dual grid. Um, and then um, I, I, I have a problem understanding this because in the- You mean this one? This one, yeah. yeah. Yes. In the classical E scheme that you mentioned at the end, which is basically like a, looks like the second order version of, of uh, your, your approach. Yes, it is, yes. Mm -hmm. But then, but then in, the, in the E scheme, the elect, for example, the first equation, if the electric field is on, on a grid, then the magnetic field should be on the dual grid and vice versa. But here they seem to be on the same Grid, so I don't understand. What, so, okay, how they are in the same grid and not if I they should be in the yield scheme. They are they are one one field you know, is on a grid and the other field is on a, on the dual one. But here, they are both in the same. Yes, but grid. that you do like when you when I go uh, later on here. So so what I then do is I represent or so I go from uh, say in this equation i i take this one because i only work with the b on the on the yeah okay on on the primo crit where e is on the dual uh, yeah. and then i i just use uh, this this hotch operator to uh, go from the dual oh. uh, to the primo and in the lowest order which is the same as the u scheme uh, this okay. is just an identity yeah. operation oh, oh oh now it's clear okay thank you very much Thank you very much. Yeah. Crazy okay. That, uh, <laughs> Sorry, yeah, okay. I should have <laughs> been more clear on that. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Okay. Are there other questions? 
yeah so maybe Please. maybe i can yes. ask you a question sure. um so so i guess the amr in mrex stands for um, adaptive mesh refinement do, do you use that here no not at the moment uh so so what do we are uh, interested in is um, firstly using the uh, uh i mean relating back to uh on his question to Mata, also about other boundary conditions. So using uh, the embedded boundary facilities that are there in um, RX um, in order to, to be able to, to look at complex domains. Uh, then RMR, RMR, RMR <laughs> could, could be a feature that, that we could potentially use in future, but it, 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 we haven't explored that yet. But this would be in X, I imagine, right? I mean, yes. Yeah. Only in X, but I mean in in yeah, B, yeah, it's sure, it's sure. already uh, that. Sure, sure, yeah. Sure. Okay. Yes. Other questions? Well, if not, let's thank the speaker and the speaker or all the speakers of the afternoon section. Thank you very much. Uh, Maybe the organizer has uh, something to say. Oh yeah, Lucas, thank you. Yeah, there is a question in the chat. Um, oh, there's a question. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so the question was, is it possible to consider high order mimetic finite difference within the aim of, uh, Armrex framework? Uh, if so, how complicated is it? And so, I mean, I showed you some results uh, with the high order, so it is definitely uh, possible. So uh, these results with the higher order uh, uh, schemes are done in, in Armrex. And yeah, it's, uh, of course, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's more costly <laughs> to do, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the usual thing that you gain uh, order and yeah. And then there's the second question. Can you comment again on why higher order particle smoothing is not always beneficial? So, okay, so this is then uh, uh, for, for this slide, I guess. So, I mean, the, uh, higher order smoothing will, will smear out your particle. And then, uh, of course, uh, the, I mean, you see that this is a bit of an increase, it increases the damping, so it's more diffusive if you have a, a high uh, smoothing factor. But, so, so you have to see the trade-off. I mean, in, in the end, uh, the, the delta function is, is what you want to approximate, but if, if you have a very broad resolution, it's better to smear out more, but if you have many particles, it's better to, to consider them sharp. That, that's what you see in, in the comparison of these two figures, but I was really quick on that. I'm sorry. Yes, I ran out of time. Okay, he okay. said thank you, so I guess he's satisfied. If there are no more questions, either spoken or written, then we can... Uh close the session and maybe the organizer is some final comment for us. Thank you to all the speakers.